Um, <clears throat> chapter 8, okay, getting into um, how muscles actually work at a cellular level. So this requires us to know, you know what, what we've learned so far about just basic cell physiology, uh, you know, the membrane, things that are present on the membrane, um, <clears throat> certain ions that are going to be involved, what we've learned about the nervous system, um, and those ions involved. Uh, bring that together here, we can start learning how specifically uh, muscle fiber physiology actually works. Um, <clears throat> you would have touched on a lot of this, um, like as far as like actin, myosin, and filaments, and that kind of stuff, that you should have heard these words before at, at some point in, in your studies. Um, but we are definitely, as, as always, going to go a little more deeper. Um, but... You should know this as well, that there are three kinds of uh, muscle tissue that are in the body. We've got skeletal muscle, we've got cardiac muscle, and we've got smooth muscle. And there are some um, basic, obvious anatomical differences between them. Um, and we are going to look then at the physiology um, that is associated with their differences in, in appearances and things like that. Um, so these three kinds, I give some facts up here, but these three kinds of muscle tissue make up about half your weight. Okay. Um, we know that skeletal muscle, uh, out of the ones listed, skeletal muscle is strided, meaning what? It looks what? Like striped, okay? It's got very um, uh, distinct bands that run through it. We're gonna, you're going to be able to tell me when we're done with this, what makes up these bands, why are they there, uh, what happens to them when a muscle contracts and that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, that makes up the muscle system. Um, and then... Keep in mind what we're talking about here. It says skeletal muscles are innervated by the somatic nervous system. And remember, we have two big divisions of our nervous system. What are the two big divisions? Okay, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system. Which one of those can be, that we talked about, can be further subdivided? The peripheral. And we subdivide it into, not yet. Peripheral nervous system can be divided. It has to do with direction. There you go. Afferent and efferent. Okay? Now, your, one of those can actually be divided again, which is what we're getting at here. Which one of those? You might remember. The efferent, okay, the one that goes away from this nervous system, um, can be divided into the autonomic and the somatic nervous, uh, parts of the nervous system. Um, autonomic, of course, will go to, you know, so, sort of like automatic, goes to things you don't have to think about, uh, things that are uh, like viscera, different organs and, and bodily functions, that kind of thing. Then you've got the zomatic uh, part of it that's going to go to actual muscles and help control bodily movements and that kind of stuff. So that's what we're talking about here when I say the zomatic nervous system. All right. <clears throat> now, here's where you, we know that the other, of the three muscle types, tissue types that exist, um, there's some overlap in terms of their characteristics. Uh, for example, striations. Striations occur in skeletal muscle. Striations also occur in cardiac muscle. But they're actually very, dis they're, they're different. And the, the big reason they're different is down here, the fact that skeletal muscle is, of the three is the only one that's completely voluntary. Um, whereas cardiac muscle, thankfully, we don't have to think about flexing our heart. It is involuntary, right? So cardiac muscle and smooth muscle then are volunt involuntary. Um, however, only smooth muscle is unstriated. So you can see how they sort of all overlap. And if you've got a picture there, you can see there's definitely no striations here. It's very smooth, um, hence its name. Over here, very distinct banding patterns and striations with skeletal muscle. And then sort of you get a mix between the two with, with cardiac muscle. Okay? Um, you will see that it is, it is striated, but nowhere near as organized as such over here. And we'll learn why, okay? why, why that is the case. All right, now, as far as uh, looking at up close at a cell, a muscle fiber cell, um, what, what's important to note is that a muscle fiber, okay, um, when we say a muscle fiber, <clears throat> we're talking about an actual muscle cell, and it's really, really long. Um, a muscle fiber or a muscle cell will stretch all the way across the length of the muscle, for example, the bicep muscle. When you've got the ends of it down here and the ends of it all the way up here, one cell which is one fiber, will actually run the length of that entire muscle. Okay? And that's going to be important. Otherwise, the muscles won't be able to contract like they do, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so you've got this. Take this muscle right here. There's your tendons where you're going to attach them to 
um, <clears throat> to their points of insertion or origin, depending on you know where, what we're talking about here. Here's the actual muscle, right? Um, notice that the tendon actually fades into the muscle. All the fiber is connected. What starts to differ there is you know the contents that are inside the cells at this point versus down here where it's sort of a reddish color. We'll get to that too. Um, okay, so if you take this whole muscle and you chop it in half and you look down inside of it, you see this. You've got all this connective tissue, this fascia kind of stuff that's interwoven like this honeycomb appearance and sort of bundles it all up and keeps it organized. You can actually pull out one of these little um, areas, which is this here, and within that are all these little tiny little fibers that are all packed together. Okay, so there's a whole lot of fibers inside one of these, uh, inside a muscle. So in each little single fiber is going to be a single muscle cell. So let's pull that out. Okay, here's what we've done. Pull it out further. Um, and now what you're looking at here, this is one fiber. Okay. This, is, this, this itself is actually one cell. There's a lot of things that are highly organized within that one cell. But this right here is actually this little thing right here. And so this is the entire cell. It'll have its cellular components. It'll have its organelles in there. They're just not shown up here. Okay, now within that, it's even further subdivided into tiny, tiny little strands <coughs> that are called myofibrils. And what a myofibril is, um, is there are what's called contractile units that make this entire fiber um, contract. And there's a whole bunch of them. And each one of them is this area right here. You can see where these stripes are. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about them down here. But you see these. There's a whole bunch of them, of these little units. They're, they're molecules that are like uh, lines that are positioned like this relative to one another. Okay? And they're, they're alternating. There are a whole bunch of them right through here. They make up these tiny little fibrils. And all of them packed inside of a cell make up an entire fiber. So you can see that one muscle fiber has a whole lot of these individual uh, this, this is one unit sort of strung from one end to the next all the way down. There's a whole bunch of those that go the entire length of the, of the entire muscle. All right, so what you need to realize is that a muscle contraction occurs all the way down at this molecular level. We're talking about molecules down here. This is how small this is, okay? Like protein-type molecules that are interlocking with one another. So the, the basis of a, mus a muscle contraction is molecular. We're going to get all the way down to the very, very bottom. All right. So let's take a look at one of these little areas right here. So here's our muscle. Here it's cut in half. Here's all the compartments. We're going to pull out a single muscle cell fiber from that. And when we do, you see a bunch of tiny little units all packed inside of this little myofiber. Okay, so all these myofibrils you see here are all part of the same cell. We're pulling out one of them. When you look at one of them, you'll see something that looks like this. See this little line right here and this little line right here, what you see right here. Okay, this little empty space on the other side of a darker line you see right here. We're going to look at what happens in one of these little areas. What you will see is, is our defined unit is what's going to be called a sarcomere. Okay? Um, one of these little units from this line, see this zigzag line, it's called the Z line. From one Z line to the next, from here to here, from here to here, that's one of these things right here. Okay? This is going to be the functional unit, the functional contractile unit of a muscle. Okay? Now, there's a huge number of these all over one muscle, right? Because you can see how many of these there are in one myofibril, how many myofibrils there are in one fiber, and how many fibers there are in one muscle. So there's a whole lot of these. What we're going to look at is what happens right here that causes the muscle to contract and how does it happen. Okay? All right, so that's all this. Now, we've got myofibrils, which are these little things we, pu we pulled out from the muscle cell, okay, the muscle fiber. We've got fibers and myofibrils. Fibrils are smaller than fibers. Um, now, we've got what's called actin and myosin. You've probably mentioned that or heard of it before. Let's look at it at, at a molecular level. How are they different? Um, what, what you've got here is if you take a look at, at one, what's called one sarcomere, defined from this line to this line. Let's pull that down and let's look at it. Now, these are... Just, and these are just illustrations now. They don't really look like this. But um, if you take a look at, see this big pink line right here? What that actually is, if you look closely and take one of these, okay, and we blow it up and look at it, what you get is what's called a thick filament. It is a, a protein-based filament. It's a whole lot of molecules sort of stuck together to make one mega molecule. Um, and it's got a bunch of, it's sort of like a, imagine pulling spaghetti out of a box and there's like a whole bunch of little, um, sticks of spaghetti all together to give it more strength, and you can imagine that. That's sort of like what you get here, except at various places along this, instead of it being smooth, 
some of these guys curl up on the end like a golf club, like a head of a golf club, and there's two little spots sticking out of it. It's like a, a bifurcated, um, I like that word, bifurcated golf club or something like that. Okay? <clears throat> You'll see that it's, it's going to be used to grab something here in a minute. So these are your thick filaments. You see them in red right here. That's myosin. Okay? Myosin are, are the, the more durable filament that you're going to find within this sarcoma. The other one that you're going to see is symbolized by these blue lines right here. Notice, get an idea as to, as to the anatomy of this. Okay? If you notice, you'll see that um, the Z line can sort of anchor in these little blue lines. And these blue lines never touch each other. Right? From this side to this side, there's that space between them. And underneath there, sort of alternating between them, running parallel to them, are these myosin thick filaments. They're going to be underneath. What you're going to see is you're going to get a molecular interaction, a chemical interaction between this guy. He's actually going to physically grab onto, the, the pink one could actually physically grab onto with these heads, one of these blue lines, which are going to be something, it's not a blue line, of course, it's an actual molecule. And it'll ratchet it, sort of like a, you would use a ratchet wrench. It'll bring these things together and cause a shortening of that sarcomere. When every sarcomere in the entire muscle does that, and the entire muscle fiber does that, the whole thing gets shorter. That's a muscle contraction. Okay. All right, so if you take a look at one of these blue lines running parallel to the, to the pink ones that we saw, you'll see a little, it looks like a bunch of beads that have been twisted with a rope on either side. Okay. This is a thin filament, this whole thing. Now, it's got little pieces. We're going to have to look at the little pieces individually. But you can see the little pieces here. The whole thing, though, is called actin. So this is actin. This is myosin. Maybe you've heard the word sliding filament theory. I don't know. But if not, you're going to now. If you have, now you're going to learn why it's called that. These filaments, you had a thick filament, which is the pink, the thin filament, which is the blue, and they're actually going to slide towards one another. And when they do, that's going to be a muscle contraction. Right? Okay, now, one thing that you're just going to have to sort of memorize, and I'll give you plenty of practice with it. You'll actually have to do it in the lab. We're going to take, um, our next lab will be, assuming our stuff gets here, is we're going to take rabbit muscle, and we're going to isolate single fibers. We're going to treat them with certain solutions. And you'll see which ones in a minute when I go through this. And you'll cause them to, to contract. And you'll have to identify what zones you see, what ones got bigger, what ones got smaller, that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of neat. Um, <clears throat> all right. So notice that there's they, this uh, sarcomere unit that you see right here. Here's a three, three sarcomeres all stuck together. Okay. When you look at that, you can actually identify different areas. We can map those regions. And we, it, that helps us explain what's going on. And, and when we reference something, you'll know what we're talking about and that kind of thing. Instead of just saying between the something, something, we can just say, okay, the A band or the H, H zone or whatever. Um, so what are these things called? Now, if you look here, I don't know what order I go in over here, but it looks like, well, the A band's first. Okay, what, is, what do I mean by the A band in a sarcomere? Um, <coughs> notice it just says the thick filaments, which are your myosin. Um, they're stacked along with parts of the actin. In other words, take a look. Notice where this is labeled A band, right here. It is the length, the entire length of one of those thick filaments. See that? What else is important to note? Okay, so this whole length, if you're looking at it from a distance, you're looking at those, those pink lines stacked up on top of each other. And the length of those is going to be your A band. But also, what is in here, okay, are parts of a little overlapping part of all these actin molecules. Okay, so see that. So you've got an A band that is defined by the length of the myosin filament, but realize that it includes some overlapping parts of the actin filament as well. Okay? All right, now, what is the H zone? Looks like that's next. The H zone is that little place where those tips of the actin never meet. Okay? So right through here, it goes right down the center. The H zone is a zone that runs right down the center of the A band. I know it all sounds like gibberish right now, but you'll get plenty of practice with it. Um, so here's your A band. Here's your H zone that runs right down between them. Okay? Now this zone, like I said, it's defined by the, the tips of this, these actin molecules that are apart from one another. What you will see, for example, and I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate this when I, when I get as I'm explaining it, but what you will see is during a muscle contraction, during a, a sarcomeric unit contracts, when it contracts, the myosin filaments will not change. 
in terms of their length. All those little golf club heads I was talking about are going to start doing this, and they're going to start ratcheting. They're going to grab onto something, pull it, let go, and each one of them at a different time will grab and pull at a different time so that you get a net movement inwards of these, of these little blue ones, of these um, actin filaments. So these thick filaments are going to grab these thin ones and start ratcheting them in. And what you will see is that when a muscle contracts, the A-band does not change in size because the A-band is defined as the length of this thick filament right here. It's not going to change. <coughs> the H-zone, however, what do you think will happen to the H-zone? It'll squeeze in. It'll get smaller, right? Because these tips are getting ratcheted in. They're going to come closer together. So you'll see that the H-zone actually shrinks during the muscle contraction. All right, um, now the M line is just, uh, this. it's in reference to this thing right here. It's a line, actually, that juts right through the center of the H zone. Um, and the I band looks like we're right here. The I band is the distance from the end of one thick filament to the thick filament and the sarcomere next to it, okay? So this right here, this distance right here will be called the I band. All right, that's, that's enough. All right, so what you need to realize is that this is three-dimensional, right? If you go back to this picture on the previous slide, you can see how this works. We're looking at it on a flat screen, but in reality, it's a cylinder. It wraps all the way around. It's like it's three-dimensional. So we've got to realize that this happens not only in two dimensions like you see it, but all the way around, behind it and curling up underneath it. So if we consider it like that, you can start seeing a picture, something like this. Here's your thin filaments. The blue are the actin, remember? Your A-band is this width of the thick filament. Okay, I-band is the distance between. Um, the H-zone would be in here, even though it's not labeled. Um, and not only that, I want you to see how impeccably organized all of this is. Look at it from the center instead of from the outside, and you can see how organized it is, how equidistant and geometrically arranged all these thick filaments are from one another, and how each one is surrounded optimally by... Um, in this case, it looks like six is going to be you know, surrounded by a, a certain number, if all possible, of, of actin filaments to ensure maximum interaction between them. Okay. All right. Um, so actin is going to be your main thin structural protein, the little one. You will see that, and I'll show you in a second, the actin, the tiny one, it, like the one with the beads all twisted up in a ladder with ropes on the side, that's actually going to have a binding site a specific site whereby it will bond to the myosin, the thick film, to get an interaction. I'll show you that. And those binding sites on myosin, those little golf club heads that I was talking about, those are actually have a name. They're called cross bridges. Okay, cross bridges. <coughs> okay, now, instead of reading all this, I'm going to show you this picture. Okay, and then you can go back and read that on your own if you'd like. I'm just going to say the same thing. Now, I want you to imagine what we're looking at here. We're looking at a sarcomere. Remember that functional unit between two Z lines. We're looking at, if we were looking at a sarcomere, we would see the, our, our A band that consisted of like uh, uh, myosin filaments, thick filaments stacked on top of each other. And then above and below each one, you would have thin filaments, these actin filaments. Now what we're going to zoom in on is the interaction between one of those thick filaments and let's say that one thin filament that's right above it. It's getting ready to grab onto it, ratchet it, and shrink it in. Okay? All right, here's what you're going to see. Here's a myosin cross bridge. It's just one little piece of the entire molecule. This is where it's going to come in contact with the th entire thin filament that we're going to call uh, actin. Now, we're going to further give some vocab here and break actin down into its parts. Notice that these sort of look like not only beads, but sort of like olives, too. I mean, they've got like pits in them. Now, those pits are key because those are going to be the bonding sites. That's the place on this molecule where the chemistry is such that if it's exposed, if that site is exposed, almost think of it like that little green dot. If it can come in contact with that green dot up there or any of those, it'll bond. It'll, it'll stick together. So the key is what, what must happen in the body, what can happen to expose this, to take these ropes, slide them down, get them out of the way so that those pits, so to speak, are exposed. How can we do that? The key is going to be this ion right here, okay? calcium. Calcium is going to be very important for muscle contraction. All right, so we've got the rope that you see wrapped around here, and the rope is called tropomyosin. And I have to know that. Tropomyosin. A 
Associated with tropomyosin are these, in, are these uh, little, those little triplet things of yellow that you see at periodic places on that rope called troponin. So you've got troponin and tropomyosin. At first, it's going to be a little while before you keep them straight, but realize that's, that's what you need to know. Troponin and tropomyosin together make up this rope structure that's going to bind the, the binding, uh, cover the binding sites on this actin molecule. Okay, but what can happen? Notice that this is relaxed. When a muscle is relaxed, obviously it's not contracting, and as such, these maintain separation like you see here. Okay? Now, if you look over here, uh, look at what's going on. We're looking at it, you know, one molecule at a time here. You can see that, okay, there's an actin. The actual actin molecule are these little blue guys that you see up here. Okay. Um, right now, this binding site is covered. Okay, tropomyosin is, is um, on the, the whole rope, is holding these uh, troponin molecules, like you see, um, and they can cover these binding sites. Now, thus this cannot attach. All right, now, what happens when calcium gets released in a muscle cell? What you will see is we're going to go back to, um, we talked about the smooth ER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. If you remember that from our cell physiology chapter. Um, we had rough ER and smooth ER. And I mentioned, I don't expect you to remember, but I mentioned at that point that we're going to come back to the smooth ER because it's going to have a special role to play in muscle physiology. What happens is there is an abnormally large amount of, of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. To the point, and it has become so specialized, and, and what it does, it actually has a new name now. Okay, instead of calling it smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cell, we call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum because it's in the sarcomere, and it's in the cytoplasm of a, sar in a sarcomere, so we call it a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, its most important job in the muscle cell is to hold up. It's like a giant sack of calcium is what it's going to be. Um, and what you will see is when a nerve impulse reaches what's called a neuromuscular junction, the point where the neuron, axon, uh, the knob, reaches a, a little place uh, right on a muscle cell where then the neurotransmitter has to jump across and go to a muscle cell. When that happens, an impulse is sent because muscle cells can actually conduct an impulse like a nerve cell can. It just can't generate its own impulse. Okay? It can conduct an impulse if, it feed, if a feed comes in from a, neuro, from a nerve cell. So it'll go into this nerve cell or into the muscle cell It'll start traveling along the membrane of a muscle cell, and there are these little invaginations that occur, little holes almost uh, in these muscle cells. It's almost like they travel along, and then all of a sudden the membrane dives down, and it goes in. And when it goes in, it's going to pass along this information to the, sar to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum then releases all of this calcium that's stored up. And when it does, it can float around. I'm going to show you pictures of all this, so don't worry if you didn't understand anything I just said. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the calcium then can float around inside the cell and come in contact with all of this action going on right here. And when it does, it bonds just like this. And when this bonds, it slides it sideways a little bit, changes the chemistry to the point where this is now exposed. And when that becomes exposed, there's a chemical attraction between the tip of this cross bridge that you see right here and an actual actin molecule, and they come together. Okay? Now, ATP is going to be involved in this process because as long as ATP is involved, this is like a trigger on a gun that's cocked and ready to go. Okay? As long as ATP is continually present in the body, the second those bind, the, the trigger gets pulled and it flings it forward. And if ATP comes back in, it'll cock the trigger. And then next, when it bonds again, it's going to fly forward. And ATP is going to keep cocking that trigger until there's no ATP left. This is going to play into what's called rigor mortis and a little bit later. I'll explain that to you. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so at this point, notice what happens when calcium is present. It'll actually... By doing this interaction, calcium actually interacts with the little yellow ones called troponin. When it, calcium interacts with troponin, it changes the chemistry of this entire strand that you see to the point where it slides sideways and bears these sites. And when these sites are bare, myosin can now come in contact with actin, and that's the, rat, the ratcheting thing is going to start. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> that's what that previous slide explained. You could overload it, sure, but th there's a lot of things that, that could go uh, wrong, you know, with, with too much. I mean, you've you got to realize not only are we dealing with muscle contractions in, in particular, but when we get into talk about cardiac physiology, calcium is going to have a very, very important role in cardiac physiology, um, general nerve transmission. 
So probably um, what you have to worry about more with, with an excessive calcium intake is going to be a, a cardiac type of situation as opposed to a musculature type of situation because this is probably not deadly. Um, whereas if you know, a cardiac situation is not something you want to mess around with. I'll explain that in the next chapter. Or you'll see what I mean. Okay. Um, all right. So we call this the sliding filament mechanism. All right. Um, here's the com this is the components of it. We broke it all down. I've already explained that to you, though, in the previous slide. So here's the individual pieces that all come together to make what we call this thin filament, this axis. Um, notice these cross bridges here, the actual point of binding on the thick filaments. Okay, keep this in mind. Now, when these two things come together, okay, like up here, when this comes together, these are anchored in, these thick filaments. They're anchored in their position. They're stuck together. So the only thing that moves on them are those little heads. That's it. These, however, <coughs> are anchored to, think of them as being anchored to that Z-line, the thing that's in between that defines a sarcomeric unit from the one to the next. If those things are anchored in, and these are just anchored to nowhere but themselves, and this is grabbing from both ends, this is grabbing, if this was a Z-line right here, okay, and there was a Z-line right over here, and this was grabbing an actin molecule that was sticking out from this one, and this one was grabbing an actin molecule that was sticking out from this one, and they were both ratcheting towards each other, you could see that the force is sort of all balanced out here with all these guys. It's not going anywhere because it's pulling equally from both directions. It's sort of stuck in the middle. But what will move is this will move this way, and this actin will move this way. The point is, this doesn't change in length. Your thick filament will not change in length. The stripes that you see on striated muscle is because of these thick filaments. And those striations do not change Okay, they, they do not change in terms of the actual length of the red lines that you see when a muscle contraction happens. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, every fiber that's involved in that entire muscle is, is shortening. And, yeah, and as such... Oh, well... Uh, no, I, I understand. I do understand actually what you're asking, and I'm going to show you an animation that will do better than me explaining it. I'll let you see all of them come together and see how that affects the muscle anatomically. I, I think I know what you're getting at, but rather than try to confuse you, I'm just going to show you a video in a second. Um, all right, so keep this in mind, that when, when you have a muscle, a single muscle cell is a muscle fiber, and within that fiber are tons of sarcomeres. Realize that with, as with like an action potential, once you excite and, and you have an action potential traveling through a muscle cell, it's going to either excite that entire fiber or it is not. You, you do not get parts of a muscle fiber to contract, the sarcomeres over here to contract, and down that fiber over here they do not. It doesn't work like that. It's all or none. Now, that doesn't mean your entire muscle contracts because we can flex to different degrees, right? We can flex a little bit or flex a lot. I'll explain why in a minute. But, it, but the fiber itself that we're talking about that receives this nervous impulse. It's an all or nothing sarcomeric contraction in terms of that. Now, um, <clears throat> realize that if you have, let's say these two guys right next to each other. Here's two sarcomeric units right next to each other. If that entire fiber that they're on receives a nervous impulse that tells them to contract, that one will contract and that one and the one next to it and the one down here all the way down the line. So what you see is the length of the entire fiber completely short. It doesn't apply tension. It doesn't, this doesn't pull and these not contract over here. If so, if these two things pulled and the ones on either end didn't, it would create tension. It would be pulling from the other end. It would be dangerous. You'd actually be, like, it's like taking a loop of string and tying it on one end, tying it on the other end, and then grabbing it in the middle and pulling as hard as you can towards the center. You could see that there would be way too much tension here on either side. So either the whole entire fiber contracts or it does not. All right, All right so what happens when it contracts? Now remember, here is relaxed. Here is contracted. Look at the difference. Your sarcomere goes from one Z-line to the next. <clears throat> Look at your A-band. Your A-band is just the width or the length, sorry, of your thick filament. When these things come closer together, you get calcium release. Uh, tropo, uh, troponin slides out of the way. Um, the entire tropomyosin complex shifts over, bears that binding site on the actin, ratchets it forward. See how these blue lines get closer. But notice what has not changed. Like I said before, the length of this A-band, sorry, the width of the A-band, because the length of the thick filaments has not changed. Definitely what did change, it's not, yeah, H-zone. The H-zone started off this big, as you can see, the distance between the tips of the actin. Notice down here how much closer together they are. Definitely shortened. 
and the entire Sarcomere shore as a result. Okay. Um, now, we call this, when, when you've got a ratchet like this and it grabs onto it and yanks it in and lets go, it's called a power stroke. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what you'll get is when you get a complete shortening, in other words, if you want to take a sarcomere and cram it all the way that you can and, and get an entire contraction, realize that one little movement, when these guys are, 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 are pulled back and they grab on and they bring it forward, that little movement doesn't make much of a difference in terms of how far that, it pulls that axis. What you get is thousands of these things happening intermittently at different times, and you get a constant fluid forward motion coming towards the center. So each one of them only moves it a little bit, but there's so many of them, and they alternate when they, when they contract, and, or sorry, when they flip and when they don't flip to the point where you get a net movement inward. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? Hopefully I'll have an animation. Um, so you get repeated cycles constantly. When one of these guys is, is, is open and, uh, of, the, of the, um, the cross bridge on the myosin, when one of these guys is open, uh, it grabs it, it flings it forward, ATP comes in, recocks it, pulls it back, and keeps doing that, and it repeats it over and over and over. And the next one above it's doing the same thing over and over at different times. And the ones below it doing it even at a different time. And they, I know, it's lovely animation. It's like a mime up here. Um, <laughs> but that's what's happening. Okay, and the net result is everything coming together. So you get repeated cycles of, of this power stroke. Now, I talked about um, the importance of calcium already. Okay? Now, you've got to realize that that link has to be broken. So at the end of one of those power strokes, when it comes in like this, the second it does that, you know, the reason that it did that was because uh, ATP came in and, and, and reloaded it. The chemistry has now changed. So the second that it does that, it's, it changes its form to make it more stable to the point where it lets go. And it, it starts all over again if ATP comes back in. Um, my point is that it's, it's, it's cycles. It keeps going on and on until something tells it to stop, and I'll show you in a second. I'll show you. I'll show you. I know. This is hard because what I'm doing is I'm telling you all the parts, and then I can't tell you the whole until I've told you all the parts, and then I'll put it all together here in a second. Okay? Just stay with me for a second. If I haven't answered your question, ask it again, and I promise I'll answer it. All right. So it's sort of because you're seeing a lot of repetition in the slides that I'm showing. You're going to see the same thing over and over. I'm just focusing on little different parts. Okay? Same thing. Okay? Notice that we're moving. In this case, this picture actually only moves. One ratchet will actually only move one actin molecule at a time, maybe. But this happens in fractions of a second in a, in a whole bunch of times. So you can see that. Here you, it's been what ATP will do is, is uh, reload this. After it snaps like this, ATP will come in and cock it back. So it can have this again. Well, sort of. The fact that when ATP comes in, it energizes it and changes the chemistry so that when it opens back up, it lets go. Yeah. It's all, it all happens so close together in fractions of a second. It's, it, you can't really pinpoint one thing. You know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of chemistry happening. And I'm skipping over a ton of biochemistry here, too, which doesn't make it any easier. So, um, All right. So here's a three-dimensional view of the same thing. Let's look at this animation. Maybe. No, never mind. In a relaxed motion, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins slide toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomere is shortened. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. Okay, there's, there's better ones. Now, I mentioned that calcium plays a very important role, right? It moves that rope out of the way, so to speak. Please don't answer the question like that. Then. Don't say, how does calcium work? It moves the rope out of the way. It's not going to cut it, but you can think of it like that in your head. Um, okay, <coughs> what we have is, uh, if you take a look at, now, these are myofibrils. Remember what that means. Th this, these would all be together collectively a muscle cell. 
This is like the, the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that you would see in a cell. Notice how it's sort of like this giant web, and it wraps everything up. Okay? So these are individual myofibrils. Um, these would all be crammed together in a cylinder 3D if it was one fiber this big. Okay? All right, notice what I was talking about here. This is sort of hard to, hard to see, but here would be actually be like the membrane. This would be a membrane that would wrap around the entire muscle cell just like the cell membrane that we've talked about in other chapters. Just all the pieces aren't shown here. What you can see right here is if you look, it's sort of like, if you can imagine looking in from the back side, this is a, a, a sort of like a cave that goes in. You could actually, you know, if it was big enough, you could stick your finger in this little hole right here, and it's a tube. It's actually an, an imagination of, of the plasma membrane itself, and it comes down, um, and so whatever... If there is a, a, a nerve impulse that is propagated across this membrane, realize it, this is part of the membrane. It just went in. So that same nerve impulse could travel down through here and get passed all the way through here. The point is to deliver that nerve impulse to these individual myofibrils. Okay? So it comes in through here, and notice that right here, sandwiched next to it, is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It can get excited from this nervous impulse. Take a look over here. You're looking at one of these. If you look up close, you'll see that there are actually little tiny, um, little tiny uh, pores that open. That can, messages can be passed through from this part of the membrane that's trickling through here into the actual sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? Notice that they're sort of linked together. Here's the actual part of the membrane. Here's part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, what will happen is... Um, it's not really shown here, but there's a, a, a set of, of, of messenger systems that can come in. And whenever that, that membrane is carrying this action potential down through here, what it will do is set in play a series of reactions, a series of, of, of messenger systems to cause calcium that has been stored up in your muscles, stored up in these big sacs that you see up here. Whenever that impulse travels through here, it activates the release from, of calcium from all of this place. And it all goes out into these spaces that you see all down through here, and now it can come in contact with that, uh, that actin molecule that we were talking about, what, what it needs to get there. So realize that as long as calcium is present, those ropes are pulled aside, and you're going to get a muscle contraction. Okay? So yes, certainly, with, 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 and cardiac muscle is going to behave in a similar fashion. So that's why I mentioned a while ago you're, it's more concerning with cardiac tissue. But realize that the same thing, like locally especially, if you can have a local sudden increase in calcium, for example, you could sustain a muscle contraction. Okay? Because what you've got to be able to do is whenever all that calcium is released from this storage area and goes out into, into bathe this tissue, um, it's got to be uptaken very quickly in order to relax that muscle. Okay? Otherwise, as long as it's there, that's still bared out of the way and you can get a, a cross-link interaction between your thick and thin filaments. Okay. <clears throat> These are called T-tubules, by the way. I think I mentioned it up here. Passes along the membrane of the T-tubule. This is called a T-tubule. It passes through part of the membrane. Okay, so <clears throat> take a look. Here's what I'm talking about. Acetylcholine is going to be your neurotransmitter of choice here between um, the somatic nervous system and the actual muscle tissue that it innervates. So acetylcholine will be uh, released, um, and when it binds, it crosses the synaptic gap. This is a, a neuron here. This is a, a feed from a neuron into a muscle cell. It will actually land right on top of that muscle cell. Uh, and when it does, it activates these second messenger systems from the neurotransmitter, and then all of a sudden, an influx of, of, of sodium or what have you, you've got this action potential started. It's being propagated along the membrane of that muscle cell. It can get passed on. Some of it will keep going. Some of it will turn in here, and it'll pass down. And when it does, notice these calcium ions that once were stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, now they leave. And when they go out, here's where they're going to go. They actually float down into the individual sarcomeres, when they get there, they pull this out of the way. They allow cross-bridge interaction, and bam, they start to ratchet together. Okay? Think about how fast that happens. You can't trick yourself. We're trying to do that kind of thing backwards. Um, all right. Okay. Well, anyway. Okay. Um, I already pulled this, or already, uh, already discussed this. Now, one thing about this, let's see if it's a picture here. I can use it. This is, I'll use the picture to explain the previous slide. Um, I talk about ATP, and I've mentioned it, and now we're going to see where it plays in. Um, 
whenever you have a uh, the here's the uh, a detached a detached uh, crosslink. This is from your th thick filament. Here's from your thin filament. Uh, the other pieces aren't shown. All the the ropes and the everything else. But um, <clears throat> when ATP is present, when ATP comes in and bonds to this, okay. Um, it will burn an ATP, and in so doing, that's why it's, it gets, turns into ADP and PI, stands for inorganic phosphate. In other words, realize that ATP is an adenosine triphosphate, right? ADP is an adenosine diphosphate. If I take a phosphate, a phosphate, a phosphate, and an adenosine, put them all together, I've got an ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate. So this is indicative of the, the ATP has been split because there's a diphosphate and another phosphate. Add a di and one more and you got to try. Okay, so that's where this is coming from. So anyway, I can use ATP to reload this and pull it back. Notice it, it took energy input to make that happen. Just like you would, if you're cocking a gun, it requires energy to pull it back. Okay. Um, all right, now, if there is no calcium release that happens in this particular muscle, there's no impulse uh, sent to cause a calcium release, or there's no local injection, there's nothing that you've done to yourself to cause a calcium release, it remains resting in this state right here. Okay? However, if there's an excitation and calcium gets released, you're going to get a movement. Right now, this is ready to go, but the problem is these sites are blocked from the troponin-tropomyosin complex. That's not shown here, but realize that's why these things aren't interacting. The second calcium is present, those slide out of the way, and you get an interaction here. The second you get an interaction, it changes the chemistry to the point where this wants to flip inward. Okay? Now, when it flips inward, it, it, it's had that energy that was stored up in it, by flipping inward, it released that energy. So the only way it's going to get able to open up again is if you use an ATP to, re, to open it up. Okay? So <clears throat> there's the bending, there's the power stroke, you lose it. If you've got more ATP available, you can attach it, and you can actually pull it back and re-energize it, burning that ATP. Bring in the ATP, split it, which is this. And by doing so, cock that back and ready to go again. And it's ready to go. It's ready to pull the trigger if it can bond with this. If there's more calcium present there, it will. However, what happens when, AT, when cells die? Okay? And when cells die, guess what you don't make anymore? ATP. So what would happen is, for a period after you die, your cells could live for a short amount of time, right? Your, your heart may, may cease to beat. Your uh, brain may stop functioning. However, for a short period of time, there's still some residual nutrients and, and things like that. Not too much waste is built up. Your cells are going to function for a while. You may still have some ATP stores that are slowly getting burned as things shut down. As long as you have some stores and as long as ATP is present, you will continue to short. Like if you die, why can your muscles start to contract? It's because... They don't relax. They, 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 any ATP that's there will start to continually to contract those muscles, and, and you'll get this cross-bridge interaction. It'll start to work. But eventually, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have brought it in and not had any ATP to open it back up and relax those muscles. Does that make sense? You see what I mean? So what you get is right here. It's called the, the rigor complex. You get this bending in, but it, notice that to let go of this and to cock it back requires an input of ATP. If there's no ATP there, slowly what happens is they get stuck in this position, and they can't let go. So you get a shortening, you get a contraction of those muscles, and it's very stiff, and that's why you can't relax that person uh, without bringing them back to life and putting more ATP in their body. There's not much point, I guess, in pumping them full of ATP. But, um, <clears throat> anyways, that's, that's the theory behind that. Let's take a look here. There's no cool CSI video I'm getting to show you. Oh, bull, don't tell me that. Why? Huh? No. The original. Let's see. Let's see if I can. I want to show you this video because it'll help. This particular video is going to be 
from an entomology, a, a guy, an entomologist is the one who did this. So it's going to be, an, it's going to start with a picture of a grasshopper, but it's the same concept. Okay, realize that we sh we share the same interplay of molecules and muscle contraction. So we're taking a closer look at individual fibers within that muscle. And this gets kind of old because he does he goes doesn't the guy who designed this did a little too long in some of these things. He traces every single fiber so you know. So we'll pull out a single a single fiber, one cell. And notice that it is multinucleated because it, it's got a long span. We've got to move from one end of the muscle to the other, so it's not very efficient just to have one nucleus in that entire length. So this muscle fibers are multinucleated. Everything's everything's multinucleated. Yeah, you got to fill in your own sound track. But the, I like this because it starts out big and narrows it all the way in. Feel free to narrate. You know, it feels like you know, do one of those Mystery Science Theater 2000 or whatever. Do a voiceover. Kind of neat though that a grasshopper does it the same way we do. I don't know if you always think about that. We're not all that different. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> no. It takes a lot. I mean, I teach, I teach this stuff for a living. So, I mean, see, this is what I was talking about. I want you to see this. When, when one muscle, muscle, when one muscle fiber receives an impulse, all the sarcomeres on that fiber are all going to contract. So, as a result, the entire muscle fiber will shorten in length from one end to the next. Okay, that's why it bulges together. That's why it comes together because it has to. It's the only way it can happen. Now, these cross bridges look a little different than the slides I showed you, but it's the same concept. So. But this one does a good job, too, of showing you that ATP rule here in a second. Show you every one, just in case. I, I'm afraid I'll skip some. So. You can see how it's repetitive. This is a slow motion version, but it's constantly let go, grab, pull, and then different ones do it at different times, as you can see here. That's why I wanted you to see it too. Not all of them are moving forward at the same time. They're releasing, letting go, so you get one fluid movement towards the center. That's what I should do, design biological video games. I'm sure there's a market for that. Okay, now watch. Atari. It's been a while. I have Pong. Remember that? I have one of those. But here's what, notice what I'm talking about here. To reload that, you bring in an ATP. It's ready to go. As long as those cross bridges are available and that, that binding site's available, it'll pull it forward. Got to have ATP to reload it, though. Now, when the calcium stops being there, 
even if it's re you know even if you get a reload in terms of the the myosin head if that calcium stops there's nothing to grab onto and eventually they're going to settle back those those thin filaments will settle back into the original position where they want to be it's a relaxation the only way they're going to contract is if something's still holding on to them okay some something some of these still have to be grabbing onto it and holding on to it because once it's relaxed its natural resting state is to spring back the way it was That's right. This is whenever there's a nervous impulse being sent to this muscle to be contracted. That's, what, that's what's going on. Okay, there's that. Is this stuff making any sense? Well, you kind of had enough to do with it already, I think. I mean, yeah. All right, so this whole rowing, when you see the word rowing, it's a continuous. The rowing is the grab on, release, grab on, release at different times. Okay, keep going. Um, already talked about a tendon. Realize that a tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. We already know that. That's something you learned in 102. Um, a single action potential in a muscle fiber produces a twitch. In other words, a contraction of that muscle fiber. Notice I'm careful not to say produces a contraction. Um, because what you will see is tension, whole muscle tension. The reason that you can have different degrees of muscle contraction, you can flex it a little bit, flex it more, um, doesn't have to do with how much you pull it like this way. That doesn't, that's not what's going on in a, in a skeletal muscle. Uh, whole muscle tension has to do with how many of these fibers are contracting. Are you, uh, are, are you recruiting a whole bunch of fibers all to contract at the same time? If you are, you're going to get a, a big contraction. Are you, just, are, you, are you just recruiting a couple fibers, you know, a small handful of fibers? If so, you're going to get a little bit of a contraction. Okay, it's sort of like of all the fibers present, the more of them that are contracting, the greater the muscle contraction. That makes sense, right? So that's, that's what um, gradations of muscle contraction, how that's going to be controlled. And I'll explain that in a second again. But, um, well, it looks like I already do right here. Um, let me show you, see if there's a... Okay, well, I'll show you an animation again. Uh, but motor units, um, I'm going to bring this in now. What a motor unit is, is a nerve cell that is carrying some sort of efferent impulse through the somatic division, okay, it's things that are going to go out to your skeletal muscle. Whatever that nerve cell is, and then when it branches off, however many, whatever muscle fibers it comes in contact with. So one cell and all the fibers that it innervates, that's called a motor unit. Okay, all right. So the, t the tension that I'm talking about, the, the tension of a muscle. You know, like some people, for example, when you work out, you, you can maintain certain muscle tone, right? Your muscles have definition. They start to look like they exist in a contracted state already. The reason for that is through rep, rep, repetition and, and other things that we can talk about here in a second. Get that? Rep, 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 repetition. Uh, <laughs> um, the... Uh, uh, now I got off track. The, through that mechanism, um, you can cause a higher degree, a higher percentage of your actual muscle fibers to be contracted in your particular muscle. And, and where, you know, compared to another person, they may not have as many contracted at that particular point. Uh, the more that you work out, the more tension you create, the more fibers um, remain contracted in your percentage-wise in, in your muscle compared to someone else's. And that pulls them together a little bit more, and it holds them in that definitive shape. Okay. Anyways, um, so whole muscle tension is going to depend on the size of the muscle, first of all. Okay. Um, the extent, it's supposed to be a T, the extent of motor unit recruitment, how many motor units are you going to pull in? In other words, how many nerve cells are going to be firing, and how many muscle fibers are going to be affected? The more muscle fibers, the more motor units involved, and thus the more muscle fibers, the greater the tension you're going to create on this muscle. Okay. What you'll see here is, I know a couple things here. Now, the number of muscle fibers varies among different motor units. What I mean by this is, if you can imagine, um, take this. Take this as a, a motor unit. There's three different motor units shown here. Let's say these are individual. I know it's not drawn to scale, but say these are individual muscle fi fibers. Okay? Here's one neuron that you see right here. Notice where it goes. It innervates three separate fibers. So out of all of these, only three would be activated if the only impulse was coming from that nerve cell. Okay, so just a little bit of tension, probably not much, maybe not even noticeable. However, if you activate both of these, 
depending on who knows where these signals are going to come from. If you activate both of these, not only are you activating those three, but you're activating these three as well. And they're different. They're color-coded to match the cells over there. You'll see that now you have twice as many motor, uh, motor units being recruited and twice as many fibers in this case. So you get a, a greater degree of muscle contraction. The ones that haven't been entered, this guy, he hasn't been excited yet. So these two down here, they wouldn't contract. Those fibers and those sarcomeres would not be moving. Only the other ones that we talked about would be. So as a result, you're not getting a full force of your contraction. Now, if something happened where you stimulated all three, then all of these fibers that you see would be stimulated, and they would pull everything together for a much more harder contraction. Now, I mentioned this, that the number of muscle fibers varies. What I'm talking about is with one motor unit. If I have this one cell, the number of individual fibers that it innervates depends on the type of muscle that I'm dealing with. For example, if I have muscles that are performing refined, very delicate movements like with your fingers, okay, like say you're cross-stitching or you're doing something very small and you have to very much control the individual movements of the things that you're doing, you're going to find that you're going to have very, very few muscle fibers per motor unit. You know, you're not going to have one nerve cell that fires and controls like 7,000 muscle fibers you know, in, in this tiny little muscle. You're going to have maybe a few so that you can more finely control uh, how many are, are at different tensions that are at given times. Okay? Whereas like in your, your quadriceps or your biceps or something like that where you have big, they're used for bulkier types of movements, um, you're going to find that one motor unit will consist of a neuron and, mu and many muscle fibers all together. Okay? So the, the, the degree um, of, of your motor unit in terms of how big it is, depends upon how, how delicate um, the movement associated with your muscle is. Okay? All right. Um, also, there's something called asynchronous. The prefix a means what? Without. So asynchronous means without time, sort of. Um, asynchronous recruitment of motor units delays or prevents muscle fatigue. Now, it doesn't completely prevent it. Like if you contract a muscle, uh, realize that as you are, especially if you're not squeezing as hard as you can, say you're holding something, eventually you're going to get tired um, because muscle fatigue will set in. But what, it, what happens is at different points, okay, say you're holding something that doesn't require all the tension in your muscle, um, you have multi-firing. You've got some motor units being recruited and causing these fibers to contract. And then asynchronously, meaning just randomly, that one will shut off and three more will get activated to maintain that same type of tension so that the same ones aren't being, that same fiber isn't being contracted over and over and over for that entire duration. And by doing that, it lengthens the amount of time that you could physically hold something, for example. Okay? Um, you would notice a huge difference is if you were holding something and you were recruiting some motor units to contract to hold that and make that happen, and we did not have asynchronous recruitment, you would not be able to hold that very long at all, if at all, um, because the, your motor fibers, or sorry, your uh, your motor units and the fibers that they innervate would wear out very quickly, and then you're stuck, and that's all you could use. So the fact that it bounces around and shifts from these three to these three, then to these three, then to these three, allows you more duration. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at this video. Same guy. He's fast, I'll give him that. He's, probably, he's retired, too, so that's all he's got to do. Now, watch this closely. It's real simple. It's not too long. Watch how the number of motor units recruited affects the, the degree of contractility. Right? So there's four different ones recruited. Look at the difference, how much farther in it came. There's all of them. Okay. That's just to illustrate. You couldn't grasp it in your head. Encore, encore, one more time, encore. Oh, it's doing it for me. There's just... Okay. There you go. All right. Now, um, as far as it says that the tension developed by an entire muscle depends upon the frequency of its stimulation. We're going back here again to um, sort of like when we talked about uh, impulses being sent along an, uh, an axon, how, how close together they are determines the strength of that stimulus. Uh, you're going to get the same thing here. 
Um, the closer together they are, the stronger the, the, the signal for contraction is going to be in, that, in the case of a muscle cell. Um, so repetitive stimulation, constant firing back, you know, back to back to back, is going to increase the tension by what's called twitch summation. And it's sort of like the, what we've already talked about. Um, if you get them close enough um, together, they actually compound each other in terms of, of tension. Um, I don't know that, well, let's see what, what I want you to pull out of this exactly. Um, just know that <coughs> bottom line is um, tension can sort of be summed. Um, if you can get impulses sent close enough together in close enough duration, um, like you have here, like we talked about with nerve impulses, um, you can, this, this going up represents the, the, the tension on the entire muscle. So the more that you can get, not only the more that you have, but the closer they are together in terms of the frequency of the twitches, um, the greater the, the, the entire contraction is going to be. I guess that's the bottom line from all of this. Um, but realize this, though, that when you start summing your twitches together, remember what a twitch is. A twitch is one fiber in which its sarcomeres are contracted. Okay? So we have to separate a twitch from a contraction. And don't think of a twitch like you're walking around twitching. I'm talking about like an actual one fiber, and its sarcomeres receive a signal, and it shortens. Okay? Um, it's not like a contraction because the contraction we talked about the entire muscle. But what I want to point out here, what's most important is, remember, if you have sustained calcium in the cytosol, and if calcium stays around, um, you're going to keep adding on. You're going to get this back-to-back -back kind of thing because as long as there's calcium there, they're going to keep going, and they're going to keep having this, and they're going to sum together, and you're going to create tension maybe to the point uh, where tetanus ensues to the point where you get just complete contraction and it locks up. All right, I'll uh, stop there. I'm going to hand out some stuff. So, take off.